लाइफ एंड टाइम्स ऑफ सर फ्रांसिस यंग हजबेंड सर फ्रांसिस यंग हजबेंड वॉज अ ब्रिटिश ऑफिसर ड्यूरिंग द डेज ऑफ द राज एंड ही मेड क्वाइट अ फ्यू एक्सप्लोरेटरी जर्नीज इन टू द बॉर्डर एरियाज एज अ रिप्रेजेंटेटिव ऑफ द गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंग्लैंड वॉज रूलिंग हियर बट हीज कॉन्ट्रीब्यूशन टू इंडियन geography and exploration and military exploits was unique and today many things we are uh, living through was because of sir francis young husband he was an explorer par excellence he was born in 1883 at mari uh, now in pakistan a small hill station to a uh, lieutenant general uh, young husband and uh, when he was 3 he was sent her mother took him to england dorset where he was left in care of two aunts who were to raise him for a uh, young age and two aunts were very religious and strict so that gave a young as per a good military training but at the same time influenced him with religion and philosophy which was to stand him in a long way later on in his life when he was appropriate age he was sent to sanders military school as many were that time and he graduated from sanders in 1883 as a young officer and was commissioned one of the young ones to be commissioned then and he was deputed to merit cantonment in india he arrived in merit at a time when a uh, lot of things were being discussed and uh, took thought about russian advances to india or uh, explorations of various things he was put in intelligence department and with others he left for by boat to china and this was the young young husband starting his journey <coughs> from china they went across the entire taklaman makan desert and completely cut across towards afghanistan and finally reached yarkan which was the area of interest to the british now original the plan and problem was the border between afghanistan and uh, karakorums afghans were very warrior tribe and they were creating a lot of trouble there so that line had to be fixed and that was done by sir martin mor duran uh, they went through every stone and then uh, with british officers the duran line was drawn and this duran line still exists at the border between afghanistan and the british india now pakistan another interesting thing was that sir mortimer duran was a keen footballer and he established a duran cup by some generous donation and the duran cup of football still exists and is considered one of the most important uh, tournament in the football world india is that we are proud of hosting the duran cup other adventurer who was very much into foray was uh, godwin austin now godwin austin was an explorer and a glaciologist he first climbed harmukh peak in kashmir and from there he viewed k2 for the first time and uh, that time we did not know that that is the second highest peak in the world but he was the one to explore and then he went right till the foot of it and a glacier was named as godwin austin glacier uh, which remained for a long time in fact initially even k2 was uh, named as uh, godwin austin me peak but behind all this the boss was lord curzon a very strict disciplinarian from england and he was the governor general for a long time and he knew a lot about india by his interest and he was responsible for saving a lot of monuments <coughs> art and culture but at the same time he was a keen sense of history and keen sense of geography so he knew exactly where is karakoram and where is china and what is to be done about it and took keen interest to do so so all this exploration of young husband and others was conducted by lord curzon lord Kar- uh, young husband became quite famous by his long journey through china which is uh, not part of this talk for it is uh, belongs to another uh, areas and generation when he came back lord curzon sent him to england to lecture to the royal geographical society about china 
and at that taking that advantage he at 24 he became the youngest person to lecture and became a youngest person to be member of the royal geographical society at that time a very major bastion <coughs> at yarkon young husband met uh, the wazir and everybody and he was wanting to cross down south to india by a different pass but nobody knew the route except the guy called uh, turdi call which is standing behind him here so he waited for turdi call for maybe two or three months when he came they left for a crossing the mushtaq pass down to india mushtaq pass was a quite a difficult thing and this primitive uh, equipment and stores they managed to go behind to recall but the final pass was a very challenging job even today in the full mountaineering terms but with great skill and strength a young husband crossed this mushtaq pass which now is of course a well known point and came down to the karakorams now this was his journey toward the karakorams what is known as the great game it was presumed that the russians are coming down by karakoram route down to karachi and to have the warm waters of arabian sea as their port for sending the goods and away and british were very keen to prevent this and anyhow that they should not be able to go through so there was a people were explored were roaming around young husband from the british one russian and one french and this peter hopkirk called it the great game in fact the original great game name was given by rudyard kipling when he wrote this famous book kim and that kim the lama who accompanies him ultimately says that now i'm going north to play the great game and that name stuck now this is the area where uh, was all the great game what we call what is called pak occupied kashmir on the left and that was the area completely gilgit hunza and this with the border with afghanistan the duran line was the main area where uh, everybody was moving around because it was far away and uh, one did not know what are the distances and all kashmir and ladakh were that time not so much in the picture but of course as a transit point and young husband had already crossed aksai chin and uh, uh, the plateaus coming up to yarkon and there is a standard route from yarkon across karakoram pass to india so these are the areas which were part of the great game young husband would said again in 1887 once he returned from um, england to now explore yarkon and now thoroughly explore the karakorams not the cursorily coming back he started with uh, very few uh, provisions and first reached in leh deserted and from leh he crossed khardungla which is now of course many many trucks are going across but that time it was a very challenging job to take ladakhis as a porters and cross khardungla pass the route was even today by road it is difficult so one can imagine what would be in 1887 he climbed up sasoba by what is called a central asia trade route and uh, crossed uh, treacherous sasirla where it is known for its storms and where caravans can even die and uh, slowly he moved with mules going up towards the karakoram pass and in the karakoram mules are the backbones of every exploration or every explorer and without them almost nothing can move he reached uh, at foot of karakoram pass here you see that uh, white moon and right is karakoram pass and he stood at karakoram pass very early and because it was known to the british because of trade trading activities going across the karakoram pass after getting down from karakoram pass he turned towards the west and here is the with the mules uh, entering shaksgam valley now shaksgam valley was a very peculiar even today politically that it belonged to the state of kashmir and the maharaja but then after independence in 1947 the maharaja signed instrument of accession with india and technically shaksgam valley is part of india but nobody much bothered so as a result pakistan gifted it to china so it never belonged to them so now it becomes almost a de facto chinese territory and uh, it will be difficult for to cross it mule caravan was turned into ultimately double hump camel caravan which is required in from central asia and uh, in the shaksgam valley 
and this long caravan of mules was carrying a lot of equipment for survey as well as uh, for uh, political aims. Yet Afraz Gul Khan, uh, deputed by Survey of India, who standing on summit of almost any small hum, was completely making a mapping of the area and uh, looking after it. They saw K2 far in the distance in the northern point of uh, Shalsham Valley. It's now, of course, today it is part of it. And uh, this is the northern face of K2, which was first seen by him. And today people come from Central Asia, Yarkan, to climb this peak from the, this ridge several times. Going a little south, he came across uh, the peaks of Apsara Sas, which are a very high mountain ridge, dividing uh, India and the Central Asia. And there are peaks of Teram Kangri, this whole continuous range, he thoroughly explored. But his interest was to go further south. So that's what he decided to go along the Urugos Glacier. And then he came down this whole valley and uh, slowly he was here. And from there he looked at the Karakoram Pass from the, no uh, sorry, the Indira Col from north. But this is the head of the Siachen Glacier. And that time there was constantly debate whether the end of Karakoram, where Karakoram begins or where Central Asia begins and what is the Asian limits. So he looked at Indira Col and uh, he said that this is part of Siachen and Siachen Glacier is far longer than uh, we had thought of. He went toward the foot of Turkistan La and returned. On this map, what could see that Indira Col is on the top left and toward the right of it, that's where young husband reached, the foot, foot of Turkistan La. And he imagined that there is a long glacier behind it. It was his explorer's instinct and wisdom. But uh, physically it was not known and that was left to further explorers. I reached uh, Indira Call in 1998 and uh, one could see the entire uh, route of uh, Sir Francis young husband coming the Urdok glacier, the, Gor the glacier of Tortoise, because the movement of his was a very slow year. And he had reached the foot of this Turkistan La, which we reached in 98, could see behind this glacier, maybe somewhere there, young husband was standing in 1887. And this is the true division between uh, Asia and Central Asia for water melting at Indira Col in southward flow down to Arabian Sea while flowing north it will go through Yarkan and Yarkan River. So that was established by young husband the exact demarcation of Asia and Central Asia. He shared all his information with his friend Dr. Tom Longstaff in England and Longstaff was also very interpret explorer so he first came by Pakistan today what is Pakistan today and looked at Bilafon La. In fact, Bilafon La was a major scene of skirmish between India and China, India and Pakistan uh, and during the Siachen War. And one could not take this picture today. But he reached Bilafon La and looked at the Junction Peak and Teram Kangri Peaks. And he saw the glacier still further going up. He returned back to Bilafon La down to the valley and took a turn and went to snout of Siachen Glacier and came up again. And he saw the same peaks and the glacier still going ahead. So he concluded that the Siachen Glacier is not at Bilafondla, which it was thought to be, but it goes far ahead and meets ultimately Indira Kol. With his discovery, young husband, he writes, the young husband was a true prophet. Colonel Burad in the survey of India had suspected the truth. The avalanche sped pass, whose foot young husband had reached 20 years before, was the main axis of the Karakoram range, which Thus lay the miles further north <coughs> than had to be believed. We had stolen some 500 square miles from the Yarkand river system of Chinese Turkestan and joined it to the waters of the Indus and the Kingdom of Kashmir. This was a major demarcation of Central and Eastern Asia, Southern Asia and a young husband and Dr. Longstaff were main instruments to have done so. Young husband from uh, getting back to Shazgam Valley decided that as per his rules, he was to come down. He knew already Mushtaq Pass, so he decided to come by another passes. And this is the whole area which he explored and he came down with. Now, as he returned down to the Karakorams, he had arranged with the Mir of Hunza. You knew him quite well from before. And Mir of Hunza sent one Safdar Ali, here sitting in a white turban, 
uh, with a message that he is welcome guest of uh, Mira Funza and he can go anywhere. But Sabdar Ali also brought news that there is a Russian colonel roaming around in the area and looking after all the different different passes and all. And the Russian colonel was camping quite near to this <coughs> and had invited young husband to visit. He was Colonel Grombosvsky and uh, he accepted, young husband accepted this invitation to Sabdar Ali and reached the camp of uh, Grombosvsky. Now he was a very sturdy, strong uh, explorer from Russia. Ra Russia was Tsar at that time. And his interest was also almost like young husband, more of an explorer and a little bit of soldiering. But he was gathering everything and they both hit up very well. The young husband and Grombowski has a great conversation. In fact, while they were there, another French team also came and uh, they had sort of discussions with them also. And it was strange that in this remote part of Karakoram, there was French, Russian, German and Pakistanis all were roaming around and nobody had an inch of paper, let alone passport to travel. So that was the early explorations that was in a full scale. Young husband sat down for a few days and had a long chat with Grumbovsky. He was accompanied by six Cossacks, soldiers, who were, each were or six feet plus. While young husband had Gorkhas, who were normally average height of five feet. So Gorkhas very told Sir Young husband, please tell him that we are not representative of our Gurkhas. Our Gurkha regiment <coughs> is all 6.5 inches tall. The Gurkhas are selected because we are short which was, of course, the other way around. And uh, Cossacks and Gurkhas also made a platform, made him young husband stand on it to talk to Rambavaski for the first time so that their sahib does not look too small in front of this tall, hefty Cossack. <coughs> they stayed there for a few days and then uh, finally, Cossacks and Gurkhas gave a complete salute to each other in a parade. And then so young husband went south towards uh, Karakoram, while Grumbovaski moved towards east, going to Tibet. This was the final farewell where they did, uh, with the Gurkhas saluting and with the Union Jack. Young husband came down to Atok Fort, which was a huge fort built by the British for protection in the lower Pathan areas. And he passed from here back to Delhi or Shimla, wherever the governor was required. And all his details he wrote down in a book called The Heart of a Continent. He was advised this by Robert Shaw, who was a well-known author, writer and explorer and a distant cousin of Young Husband. In fact, Robert Shaw became a mentor for Young Husband and a lot of his future expeditions, climbs were guided by Robert Shaw, who trained him quite well. Colonel Grombosvsky uh, went back to Russia and uh, he had a very tragic uh, future. Tsar was toppled by the communists and he was taken as a soldier of the Tsar, stripped of all his uh, dignity and European and he was sent as a prisoner in Siberia. He served very harsh times until Japanese liberated him from Siberia in a war, it took him to Tokyo and from there they sent him to Poland where he originally belonged to. He lived in Poland in his family and remained in touch with young husband and young husband supported him with some financially and uh, sending him matters. And he also decided to write few things, but uh, nowhere he was uh, given his due as he should have been. But at the same time, young husband was a hero. He reached back uh, into his England and he was knighted with Sir Francis young husband and he was made uh, very senior members of many several clubs and several institutions of England. He was already a now well-known name in the British world. Life and Times of Sir Francis Young Husband, Soldier and Explorer. Young Husband, Expedition to Tibet. A young Husband, a soldier of the British Empire, was in India and in first part of his life in 1883 and 1887 he was sent to Central Asia and Karakoram where he came across Mushtaq Pass and returned to a hero's welcome. 
he went on a leave to England, but not for long. Soon, Lord Curzon, the Viceroy of India, wanted him back now to lead an expedition to Tibet, to open up Tibet, as there was a fear that the Russians might have been there. Already celebrated as Sir Knighted and well recognized in England, and now he was to go and explore and open up Tibet, particularly talking and discussing at Lhasa. He was resting in England for a few years, two, three years, and then he was called back by Lord uh, Karzan back to India. Now, Lord Karzan had been given information that the Russians are moving to Tibet and Lhasa. And uh, that alarmed them because Tibet was in a way that way independent and a very uh, essential uh, place of territory for India. So he decided to send what is known as the Young Husband Expedition now, led by Colonel Young Husband and uh, with the military support. But he was the overall in charge of that expedition. And their uh, brief was to go across into Tibet and the routes were decided to, and finally reach Lhasa and report if there are any Russians there. So that's why I went in there. If the Tibetans object, then they had to be put down militarily. So young husband selected a good team, so particularly two persons were this. One was a F.M. Bailey. He was known as Hatter, H-A-T-T-E-R. And Hatter Bailey was a part of his team, was very important part. And another one he took was L.A. Vedel. That Vedel was a cultural and virtually naturalist. And his job was to look at Tibetan language and all the antiquities and antiquities of uh, Tibet. There was so much of wisdom even on those expeditions. He selected to go across uh, Jelapla, then the you know, normal uh, Nathula, because Jelapla was known and used as a trade. In fact, uh, even in Mumbai, there are still people, at least 20 years before, who had been towards Jelapla to get goods. And this woolen and other goods coming from Tibet were carried down to Amritsar for the work. And from Amritsar, they were sent to Mumbai to make a final cloth. So Jelapla, that was on a very much on the world map for trading, cloth trading. Young husband prepared his entire uh, battalion and lots of soldiers, including six sepoys from India, Gurkha soldiers, and many British officers. <clears throat> and they were all put in charge of General MacDonald. Yes, here and the White Horse here. And uh, they were to march into uh, Tibet via Jelapla. They climbed up to Jelapla in a very uh, organized manner and very slowly, but then during winter of 1903, around December. And they cross uh, Jelapla Pass in middle of winter and descend on the other side down into the Chumbi Valley. And it was a very God forward and windy place. And uh, they reached the only village there, Yatum. It was absolutely primitive and uh, Yatum had nothing and all the ladies and all the lamas, they came to look at him. They had never seen <coughs> such big expeditions and so many <coughs> white men moving around from the area. <coughs> he went across and the Amochu River was flowing through some gorges. And these gorges, uh, they had to cross with uh, great difficulties. And uh, they slow, started slowly moving up along the along Kalim from Chumbi Valley and they reached Farijong. The Farijong was uh, part of Bhutan that time and uh, they looked at the peak of Chomolari. It is a very high peak about uh, 23,000 feet and uh, it was looked at with awe. In fact, uh, later on in 1980s, this peak was climbed by Indo-Bhutanese joint expedition coming from Bhutan and, and first attempt four people reached, two Indians and two Bhutanese to the summit and the second attempt, one Bhutanese officer, an Indian officer, climbed peak, but they had never returned. And it was not known what has happened to them. Sometimes it was presumed that they have fallen down toward the Chinese side, or the Chinese may have shot them, 
but the Chinese denied that they had no knowledge of this and in fact they cooperated to try to locate his body which were never found. And they Chongul Hari and they sat down and make a big camp at Chumik Shanko near at foot of Chongul Hari. And in fact Tibetans were so much uh, new to this even wheels. They never, there are no cars naturally but even the, the wheels they had seen and this was also novelty for them that how so many guns and everything can be towed very easily all along the wheels. Towards the other side, towards the north, he could look at the peaks of North Sikkim, uh, where it's a famous peak of Pauhundri. On the left side, you could see, and all the high peaks. And on the left side, what the ridge you see, that is the border uh, with Tibet. So Pauhundri is a 7,000 meter peak and a very famous and still very unknown and re remotely climbed. And there are other peaks like Guru Dogmar near a lake and looking up and Kanchen Jau. And he looked at it, all these grand, thick, fat mountains and made note of them and almost became the first explorer of these peaks. In the meantime, his expedition was ready with six scoring now portable guns. Skulls were dis dismantled and they were all being carried on uh, soldiers. And it was a slow movement, but uh, it was enough to scare the Tibetans. General MacDonald sat down at Amochu and looked at the further areas and he and his troops were constantly planning and would report to Sir Young Husband. Unfortunately, he and Young Husband did not get on well. So initially, they had lots of conflicts. But of course, Young Husband being a shrewd diplomat and even a soldier, he ultimately ruled and overruled a lot of things which General MacDonald wanted. They slowly moved with uh, now using yaks to carry the luggage and their guns. And the uh, whole team was ultimately guided by General MacDonald and his soldiers. You could see them here in their full regalia. And uh, women like this, he was a very, very shrewd and very smart officer, for sure. Now the entire army ultimately moved to Mikshenko and they were going up towards Guru. Another like, major point where they had the information, Tibetans have built a Sangar, a rock wall, to stop them. So they went in to get strength to Guru. And uh, there was a Tibetan general, your sin with the sword, you have to come. Young Asman sent him a message that uh, we come in peace and let us go. And uh, he refused to read even the letter. And that's why it looks like it was a conflict was almost inevitable. The soldiers met near Sangar. And uh, Tibetans were very naive. They have almost come with only charms from Dalai Lama uh, to ward off uh, Britisher. They had not much equipment and certainly no bullets and guns. So it was a very unequal and a very uneven contest. But the Tibetan general was unrelenting. When everybody got together and Tibetans were very in a melee looking around and uh, looking at the guns of British soldiers and there was a lot of innocent exchange. But in midst of them, somebody fired a shot which injured an Indian soldier and the Tibetan general was heard shouting in a Tibetan to attack. And that sort of uh, alarmed General MacDonald and others. So Indian soldiers got together and they opened fire on Tibetans who were almost unarmed. And within minutes, it said that 700 Tibetans were dead and were lying inside in, in the heap around this. They were no match for guns and then Maxim, the forerunner of uh, machine guns, and they were completely mowed down as such. And uh, left, a lot of people were left maimed and roaming around and uh, completely uh, without any limbs at all. With this, the team went on and uh, this massacred guru became a very major historical point. When anything unusual and suddenly it happens, it is called massacre at guru. And that term has now entered the British language, of course, in the old British language, where uh, people can talk about it. They camped at Farijong, and uh, when now next obstacle out Gyanse Fort. Now Gyanse Fort was a very major point uh, where the few routes meet, and uh, that sort of a point had to be conquered. So they went there and studied all the motors. And there was one long wall, uh, which was uh, looks like could have been climbed. So a lot of Gurkha soldiers and everybody got together and they had the 
information that the Tibetans are inside, a large army of Tibetans inside. So first they planned well, spent a week, 10 days to get everything in going. And then one on a given day, General MacDonald opened artillery at a one week point on the wall and constantly fired. And taking advantage of the hole it created, Gokhas were led by Lieutenant John Grant of 8 Gorkha rifle there and he was with Havaldar Pun. Havaldar Pun was also uh, going with him. So finally through that hole, even admits the firing, Lieutenant Grant and Havaldar Karbir Pun climbed inside and that was followed by all the other Gurkhas shouting with Gurkhas and all drawn Kukris. The Tibetans had almost heard that Gurkhas cut your nose first and ears first and then they kill you. So they were very scared. So they started running and at this high cliff where Chinese have now put up a board, they all jumped down to their deaths. Instead of being mowed down by Gurkhas, they preferred to die a year at the eternal glory is what they call it. Today on the Gyanse Fort, Chinese have put up this board uh, showing uh, as if Tibetans have martyred themselves in front of the Gorkhas. From this uh, cliff, you could look around down to Kumbum Gompa Monastery, which is also very unique. And that was a kind of a deity for uh, Gyanse Fort. Now inside Gyanse today, Chinese have created what is the title is a British Hate Museum, uh, where history is distorted and everything is put up wrongly. The guy on the right side behind, white man, is supposed to be young husband. And here are Tibetans uh, negotiating with them and signing a treaty. According to them, Tibetan drafted the treaty and made young husband sign. And uh, these are the paint paintings inside how Tibetans mowed down the British. Nothing of that had happened and they are the receiving end. There are murals of uh, Gyanse Fort and uh, showing the history and historically in the wrong way. Only decent thing is at the foot of Gyanse Fort in the Swear Square, there is a put up a lovely little monument uh, to uh, Tibetan soldiers. No mention of young husband, of course, anywhere. Now from Gyanse Fort, here on the left top, uh, they went across to Karola, which is a very high pass, and uh, proceeded along the river first to Nakartse, there is a fort which was taken over by them. And finally, they reached uh, Brahmaputra, camping on uh, different, different banks to reach Lhasa. Now this was the camp at foot of Karola on the banks of Brahmaputra, uh, that time known as Yalong Sanko, and uh, they are near the fort of Nakartse. And there are lovely cliffs where uh, also they had to look around and these are the high mountain passes they had to cross. This mountain passes and glaciers, of course, don't disappear. And they were there even in 2002 when uh, we had gone there. Uh, they had to cross uh, Sanko River, Brahmaputra, there it's called, by boat. And that took almost about 15 days to carry across all the luggage and uh, everything. So that was a very slow process. Even the horses and artillery guns and everything had to be crossed by the boat. And they slowly came across. There was no opposition of any sort. And now they are reaching Lhasa and uh, all the mules were fully loaded. And they were looking for to go to Lhasa and ultimately uh, capture the whole area. But the, still the first view of Lhasa really amazed them. And this sort of a building has been built so much in the civilization. And it's such a remote area. And how they've done the injured ingenuity of the Tibetans was unbelievable for them. There is a huge Chorten at the entrance of Lhasa, and the British soldiers surrounded there and ultimately had to march through that. And on exactly on uh, 1903, 1903, they marched through this uh, little court and they called the opening of Lhasa or the conquering of Lhasa. And this Chorten on 1903, 1903 in uh, January, young husband on a horse marched through this, and that was the final fall of Lhasa. The Chorten still exists, and uh, we as a tourist went exactly 100 years after this in 2003, uh, when we entered through this Chorten, now of course Montreal, and looked at the Lhasa Potala Palace for the first time. It was a wonder. And the Chinese have almost turned Lhasa now into a city like a mini Hong Kong. 
and there are various things not like a yagas once time uh, departmental stores and big hotels and uh, tourist malls to eat and enjoy and there are traditional temples like jakhong where uh, all sankas are being sold and this is the residence of the lalai lama uh, which is of course yet to abandon and ultimately come to india and this is the jakhong temple most the holiest site for any tibetans or buddhism and uh, that was sort of left all untouched by jenderman but from some opposite potala there is a big square and in the old pictures there was a kind of a lot of uh, houses small houses like our uh, slum areas and that was all cleared by the chinese and ultimately now you find a potala square what is called so yeah husband came here and there was nobody to negotiate with because the lila might gone away he knew that of young husbands of coming and there were no much many high officials so he stood at the potala palace and this is the you know steps of potala palace and even today they exist almost at the same route at the same place times are unchanging in tibet and the potala is a great site even today but though one can uh, many may not like the red flag of china fluttering in between but it is a magnificent building with hundreds of rooms and a big museum inside and today it is reality in lhasa that you have mao tse tung and lord buddha statue being sold together along with all the other chinese kings and kingdoms now after one month of stay young husband they he could ultimately manage to get at amban one of the high officials from uh, nearby and he came on a horse and he brought back a lot of uh, officers with him the tibet and made a big delegation which they came to negotiate with young husband there was nothing much to negotiate because young husband had come as a victor so he was not going to make any easy terms there was a lot of discussions on uh, what to do and how to do and tibet and uh, young husband was very firm and very strong and ultimately he made a treaty which was quite uneven is later on the british said and there were terms and regulations which completely crushed tibetan uh, freedom on <coughs> any tibetan initiative in fact this treaty signed in 1903 <coughs> ultimately allowed chinese to come in uh, in uh, after 40 years which is nothing much for history and ultimately using uh, basis of this treaty <coughs> they could overpower completely entire tibetan government in 1959 there was a big uh, showing of women and demonstration in potala and they were preventing dalai lama to go away but dalai lama had to go away because the chinese were coming and the dalai lama came across passes to india and rest is history as is still here now toward the end of his expedition young husband has uh, he has now done all his job the so main team started returning down same way he has come and he sent two of his officers senior officers with uh, supplies and everything to follow towards the west and all along this uh, route from lhasa to so they were to follow west to man sarovar kailash and beyond so that was a thorough exploration that he would finish off uh, all routes and everything uh, about tibet and down what should be known so they first went towards chigatse uh, they were slightly off gyanse and chigatse is a gold roof monastery and that also they were amazed to see and uh, still a big courtyard which was seen by uh, earlier days and jogun yugas once time and there is a painting in the book of uh, 1903 and one could see that people are here but then both structures have not changed time immemorial stands still in tibet and as officers went ahead on the left side they could see nanda devi and the himalayan range on the vast panorama below kailash peak and the peaks of kamet and others of india and there was a unique view that they brought back that the himalaya the south looking long, almost like a small mountains because of the infraction and the distances in tibet of course they passed through the range rakastal and mansarovar at foot of kailash and uh, ultimately reached tholing mat in the western tibet this was a mat established by adi shankaracharya when his reputed have come from mana pass and established this mat here and converted the british uh, uh, sorry the Buddha, tibetan kings into uh, hinduism which of course kept on reversing and ultimately 
this moth has remained but uh, hinduism of course disappeared from here this uh, inside of this temple was destroyed in 1967 by cultural revolution which uh, china had and marauding uh, young uh, students they came to here and destroyed everything but now they have realized their folly and they reconstruct in the temple as the board says because they now value the tourist money they went ahead from tholing mat going slightly towards the northwest to reach a place called shinkwen and there they saw this vast open uh, grounds for hundreds and kilometer you keep on walking or driving even today and you won't find a single soul living around there and uh, there are peaks lovely peaks which are get seen on towards the south and south uh, west and they all belong uh, on the border with india like for example we have this uh, gorge by which satluj river is going and we have uh, this peak of leo pargyal all coming out from the kaurik pass final point they reach which we also had followed them ultimately to shinkwen and which was originally known as ali and this is the mixture point between the moment muslim culture of the sinkian coming down to tibetan culture here at ali and the chinese has established a big military garrison as you could see down and uh, they did not seem to be minding at us going up with cameras or anything and uh, we were surprised because uh, one could look at the whole mountain ranges towards the end there is a pla star and one could look up to again leo pargyal and those peaks in fact this ali is the point from where uh, ultimately the 1962 invasion had started and uh, this is the road of aksai chin going across and in the distance one could see pangog lake coming around but they seem to be confident to allow us with telephoto lens and do pictures take what you like with this young husband and whole team was back his soldiers also returned and uh, unfortunately his expedition was not looked down very favorably by the english politicians the conservative government had fallen and labor party had taken over and they were very sympathetic towards the plight of tibetan and the strong force that young husband had shown at guru or in the harsh treaty that they made was not liked by them so young husband was uh, very delicately but strongly out of bureaucratic circles so he was given residency in kashmir to rest so in 1906 he went to kashmir and uh, he was there as a major uh, resident for there and he had a lot of powers but uh, in a way nothing politically but he never forgot his old friends as a resident commissioner in kashmir he kept on inviting his old friends from yarkan tibet and they used to come and visit him and he used to provide them all facilities and look after them and that was a really genuine uh, nature of him as he was now nearing catching up on age and uh, he was now made the president of the royal geographical society and he was earlier been given the gold medal patrons gold medal of the rgs society a one of the rare honors and very high honor of rgs and he remained here for 3 years as his uh, president and uh, was looking around and uh, ultimately he passed his time in his garden looking around and relaxing but by this time the aunt's training about religion had caught up and he turned very religious and uh, he formed the society of world religion in england and he was uh, becoming a very central figure of it and various philosophers and society people came to meet him he was friends with now many serious philosophers like bertrand russell and our own even president radha krishnan and uh, he was well respected for his views and writings so his life had taken a complete turn and uh, now with all this buddhism everything had effect on him he had turned now spiritual and was uh, in london doing his thing in uh, lhasa the tea rinpoche what they call in uh, high in potala had gifted him a little bronze statue of buddha and this he always kept it with him and uh, he absolutely loved it and worshiped it so in 1942 when he died he had built it that on my coffin you must put this buddha and with this only bury me so his wish was that we fulfill and he was buried with all honor in 1942 at age of 79 when he died and his philosopher friends had a gathering to pay tribute to him there it was written 
that nobody ever dies as long as they live in the memory of those alive, particularly those who live in the pages of history. And that's what young husband had done. He will be always be remembered as a soldier, explorer, and someone who opened up many areas for India. Thank you.